Ah, there we go. This should be the right place. Now, where's that hotel? So Amazon recently came out with a new animated series called Has Been Hotel, based on one of the most viewed animated pilots on YouTube. It was created by Vivian Madrano, otherwise known as Vivzy Pop, who is a pretty well-known name in the online space. As someone who followed her work from a small-time YouTube animator to a series director, I have nothing but praise for Vivzy Pop's determination to pursue her dreams. And I'm sure her success story will inspire many other artists and animators to do the same. I wish I could say the same about the show's writing. Despite the great animation and the performances from the voice actors, there are glaring issues with world building, plot, character development and dialogue, showing that there's still a lot of room for improvement. Considering there were 10 people on the writing team, including Vivzy Pop herself, I'm surprised that it was this bad. Who wrote this? It's great, right? But instead of going through the entire series and pointing out all the problems, I decided to section off the problems in different categories. And since the theme is hell, I decided to call them the seven deadly sins of modern writing. And trust me, Hasbin Hotel is far from the only one who's committing these sins. I can point to a lot of adult animations that have the same problems. So it might be an industry issue rather than a Hasbin Hotel issue. So to quickly catch up to speed with the story, Hasbin Hotel revolves around Charlie Morningstar, the Princess of Hell, on her quest to find a way for sinners to be rehabilitated and allowed into heaven. To do this, she creates the Hasbin Hotel as an alternative to heaven's annual extermination of wayward souls due to hell's overpopulation. At least that's what the summary tells me. And speaking of telling things, let's go to sin number one. I'm going straight for the worst one, as I consider bad exposition to be the cardinal sin of all storytelling. For those who don't know, exposition is where a character is conveying information through dialogue that is more intended to inform the audience rather than the other characters. I'm such a bad liar. If it isn't my arch nemesis. You are buying parts from an overlord? Uh, of course. She's the top weapons dealer in hell. Exposition on its own isn't bad, as good writers still need to convey the relevant information to the audience, but they tend to sprinkle that information in between natural sounding dialogue, or find an interesting way to convey it. Meanwhile, bad exposition feels like fast food. It can feel like a filling meal with all the information provided, but has very little nutritional value. Characters end up telling information other characters already know, or say it in a very boring and unimaginative way. I've invited you all here because you represent the controlling powers of our city. Together you own millions of souls. Um, Ms. Carmine, I'm pretty sure they already know that. You don't really need to explain board meetings to the board of directors. So if bad exposition is fast food, Hasbin Hotel is the deep fried Mars bar of exposition. It may not be the prettiest looking thing, but I'm willing to give it a try. And sure, a deep fried Mars bar is better for you than literal glass that is the Netflix Avatar live action series. I don't want the responsibility. I'm scared of my power. I'm scared of being alone. <laughs> But it's still not good. Most of the dialogue in Hasbin Hotel is very expository, with characters saying very obvious things in a very direct way. I'm supposed to make your dreams a reality. I'm supposed to protect you. I'm the farthest thing from in control. And this, this is my escape. There's no subtlety or even an attempt to present the information creatively. Episode one is practically all exposition. And I get it, you want to establish the characters and the premise early, but they still use the laziest techniques when it comes to exposition. It starts off with Charlie reading the story of her family and the rivalry between heaven and hell, accompanied by storybook inspired visuals. Nothing too bad. I mean, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic did the same thing, and that show was written to be understood by kindergartners. Once upon a time, in the magical land of Equestria. Once upon a time, there was a glowing city protected by golden gates known as heaven. There were two regal sisters who ruled together, it was ruled by beings of pure light. The two sisters maintained balance for their kingdom and their subjects. Angels that worshipped good and shielded all from evil. The younger sister became resentful, but he was seen as a troublemaker by the elders of heaven. She vowed that she would shroud the land in eternal night. For with this single act of disobedience, evil finally found its way into Earth. Using the magic of the elements of harmony, she defeated her younger sister and banished her permanently in the moon. Heaven cast Lucifer and his love into the dark pit he had created, never allowing him to see the good that came from humanity. Though that's not even my main criticism. 
A storybook opening can be used to establish the fairytale nature of the story or bring viewers up to speed with the relevant information. But in Hasbun Hotel, the story of Lucifer, Lilith and Adam are not relevant yet and neither of them really impact what happens in the rest of the episode, making most of the backstory completely pointless. Also, Charlie reading the story of Hell after the annual extermination happened rubs me the wrong way. She says the story helps her cope, but I can't quite understand how. I can understand wanting to distract yourself from the horrors of the actual extermination, but I don't know if reading about the extermination and the tragic tale of Hell is the way to go about it. It may just be me, but if my kind is being exterminated, the last thing I'd do is read a story about it. This scene feels more like Charlie's reading to the audience, not for herself, which I'd classify as bad exposition. Interestingly enough, you don't need to look too far for a better example, as Vivzy Pop's Husband Hotel pilot starts off treating the audience with much more maturity, as the song I'm Always Chasing Rainbows is juxtaposed with the unnerving visuals and the subtle imagery that hints at the story, but doesn't outright explain what it is. And it doesn't need to yet. But this sequence as well is captured the mood, which is a somber and a bleak one that lets us better understand Charlie's perspective. The fairy tale sequence is how she perceives her own tragic existence as the observer of this cruel and unjust system, unable to do anything about it. It's very appropriate that we first see Charlie entering a balcony as it complements her current fate as a helpless observer but also starts to establish her role as the princess of hell. You can get multiple interpretations from a few of these shots alone. First, we establish the setting by showcasing the empty streets of hell. Regardless whether it looks like this all the time or if it's just especially bad after the extermination, it visually indicates that this place is a kingdom that has fallen. Then we cut to Charlie walking towards the balcony. Pay attention to the shot composition. Look how Charlie is centered in the frame with the city in front of her. A shot like this can often be used to indicate a character's importance in the setting and the story. We then cut to a close-up that still offers us plenty of information including Charlie's lack of confidence and her emotional state. Even the way she goes across the frame gives us a sense of bleakness and defeat. Mmm, I love a good wide shot. Not only do we see Charlie's despair from her body language, we also see the location and the clock tower with the countdown timer. By having Charlie and the clock in the same frame allows us to make the connection between the clock and all the despair that we already saw. It's simple and effective. And look how much we get out of one gesture as Charlie raises her finger and shoots fireworks into the air. We actually established that Charlie has some importance in Hell as she's the one there to let the other demons know that the extermination is over and they're free to come out. Now, could she have made an announcement or rang a bell? Absolutely not. I mean, yes, technically she could have, but it's so much more thematic to have fireworks as they are synonymous with the new year. And New Year complements the premise of the show, which is breaking out of bad habits and seeking redemption. After all, we all know the phrase, New Year, New Me. And we're all familiar with the concept of New Year's resolutions. It's a fitting motif, to say the least. See how much more I got from this opening in the pilot compared to the first episode? From episode 1, I got the information. But from the pilot, I got that, and I got a better understanding of Charlie, her despair, her desires, and the world she feels responsible for improving. All of that without any dialogue. Meanwhile, Amazon's husband hotel appears to be almost afraid that the audience won't get the story. So they have to spill it out in plain words. Heck, even repeating the same things over and over again. Do you know how many times the concept of Hasbin Hotel is pitched to us as the audience? I counted three times in one episode, which is three too many in my book. Bivzy, please. You got your show. You don't need to pitch it again. It's done. Now show us what you can do with this concept. But no, for some reason we need a sarcastic expository advert, a Disney song, and a literal pitch meeting about it. It's not that complicated of a concept, chill. But in case you missed episode 1, they will remind you how the hotel hypothetically works in almost every episode. The sad thing is that the writers aren't even aware how bad their writing is. In episode 2, Angel Dust and Sir Penches are performing a play, and Angel Dust comments on Charlie's script writing. Where's an innocent kid I can sell crack to? Wow, who wrote this? It's great, right? The hilarious thing is that the only thing that differentiates Charlie's script and the show's script is the performance. If I told the voice actors to say those lines genuinely, you'd find it difficult to tell the difference. Come on, kid. It'll make you cool like me. The crackhead. I just don't want it to end up in the gutter like I used to. Whatever, nerd! I'm honestly not surprised to see a Bojack Horseman writer working on the show. I should have known when I heard the expository dialogue where characters literally tell their flaws and their character traits rather than revealing them through their actions and decisions. Did you know that Charlie has daddy issues? Do you want to know how I know? It's because Alistair told me. As she tries to work through her daddy issues by fixing you! Oh, and Husk too. What's the holdup? You got daddy issues. Would have been nice to see that from Charlie herself first. I... I think dad was right about me. 
but oh well, I guess someone else telling me about it is faster and easier than coming up with a unique scene for that. And we don't want to take away time from establishing more side characters and mystery boxes, right? Actually, I don't think we really explain these deep and complex characters. Let's make it a little bit more obvious. Luckily, Hus helps us out in episode 4. That one. That one is an insecure buffoon whose loneliness watches you idiot sleep. This one judges everyone and everything because she hates herself. Ah. Princess is a bleeding heart who wants to solve everybody else's problems except her own. And you! I see right through you and all this bullshit and how fake you are. Thanks, I didn't want to use my brain anyway. Want to see more sacrilegious examples of bad writing? Spoilers for episode 5. In this episode, Mimsy, Alistair's friend, gives us the dark and mysterious backstory of Alistair, even going as far as describing how he tears demon souls and broadcasts their screams on his radio show. All you could hear was screams. Every time an overlord went missing, there'd be a new voice screaming in the broadcast. Edgy stuff, right? And exactly one minute later, Alistair tells Husk the exact same thing. I will tear your soul apart and broadcast your screams for every other disrespectful wretch who dares to question me. Um, show, sure. did you have a Biden moment? You told us this like a minute ago? Did you forget? I don't understand. What's the purpose of having both of these scenes? They both serve the same purpose. They're completely repetitive. And you know what? You could have made these scenes work with a bit of editing. You could have had Mimsy telling the story mixed with the scene between Alistair and Husk. Maybe no one exactly knows what the strange and terrifying radio noises are. And then we cut to Alistair revealing what those noises are. The layup was there, but they just missed the slam dunk. But I'm not going to throw all the blame on Rachel Kaplan for this one as this type of repetitive exposition is consistent throughout the show, regardless of who was writing it. Whatever the reason for this type of writing, I cannot justify it. Maybe if I'm writing a kid's show? The Elements of Harmony, a reference guide. But even then, I think some of the kid shows have less exposition than has been Hotel. My Little Pony Friendship is Magic certainly has less, and I wager Bluey does too. Give your audience a chance, has been Hotel. I'm sure you can challenge them more than freaking Bluey. Yeah, bingo. You did. The second writing sin is inconsistency. We typically expect characters and plot to stay consistent, progress in a believable way, and stay within the established rules of the world. When characters start acting out of character or the plot veers off somewhere else, or worse, contradicts the prior established elements, it quickly takes the audience out of the experience. Good writers establish the rules of the world early and have well-defined characters who stay consistent throughout the story. Of course, characters can change, but even their change is coherently built upon through the narrative. I thought I'd die fighting side by side with an elf. Think of it as a road you're taking your audience through. The fewer inconsistencies, the smoother the ride. It's gonna lead to that smooth ride. And if that's the case, then Hasbun Hotel is a mountain bike course because it's riddled with huge inconsistencies. Should be interesting. I won't go through every inconsistency in the series, because there already are YouTubers like Sarcastic Chorus who go through it in greater detail, but I will point out some of the more sacrilegious ones, at least in my opinion. That's not good. Oh boy, where do I start? I don't know, how about the whole freaking premise? Remember that overpopulation thing that Charlie keeps bringing up? You know, the main reason for the annual exterminations to happen, and the reason the Hasbun Hotel was built in the first place? Yeah, that's completely irrelevant, since it's pretty much confirmed in episode 1 that angels are doing the extermination to prevent hell from growing too powerful, not that there's too many sinners in there. I'm serious, Charlie herself reads it in the first 3 minutes of the series. And as the numbers of hell grew, so did its power. Threatened by this, heaven made a truly heartless decision, an extermination to ensure hell and its sinners could never rise against them. Hello, show. Are you having a Biden moment again? You're contradicting your own plot here. Not only that, the show states that no sinner has yet been redeemed, so it's not even clear if it's possible or not. Just because nobody has made it out before doesn't mean it's not possible. Even the angels don't know the rules or how anyone gets into heaven. What do you think it takes to get into heaven? Um, Is everything okay, Adam? Give me a Ooh. good minute, okay? Adam tries to write some down, but that's far from being legitimate. So how does the show expect us to understand whether Charlie's succeeding or failing, or whether her plan is logistically possible? You need to establish some ground rules. 
You need Charlie to find out how to redeem a sinner and what kind of power is holding them in hell. Charlie's putting the cart before the horse by building a hotel first and only then trying to figure out if it's even possible to redeem a sinner. But hey, if neither she nor the Seraphim know, maybe that could have been the plot of season 1. All you have to do is move episode 8 to episode 1 and start off with the court scene. This way you could have established Charlie as the Prince of Hell, you could have used this time to pitch the hotel, and you could have highlighted the problem that no one knows how to get into heaven. This would make things very straightforward. Sarah, the head seraphim, could have made an arrangement that if Charlie manages to redeem one soul before the next extermination, they would stop all the exterminations. Simple, no? Now you could have had Adam directly involved in sabotaging Charlie's plan, you could have built up Charlie's desperation as the pressure builds up, making her turn to Alistair for help, who would probably play both sides as well. Nice, smooth, action and reaction. But nope, instead of setting up rules for everyone to play by, we just have to take Charlie's word for it, I guess. Speaking of Charlie, let's talk about her daddy issues. You know, that thing that every other character brings up? Sounds really serious. But what are those issues exactly? The family pictures indicate that Charlie was raised by loving parents, and Lucifer certainly cares a lot about her. Even when he shows up, he doesn't appear to be distant or dismissive. Okay, he's not super into the hotel, but he doesn't say it outright at the start. In fact, he seems to be mindful of his daughter's feelings. Uh -huh. It's got a lot of character! Oh! He's excited to spend time with her, and even sings about how much he can do for her. Looks like you could use some help from the big boss of hell himself. The only time he denies her anything is if he believes that it's gonna harm her, which is what a caring parent typically does. So where exactly are these daddy issues? When I think of daddy issues, I think of Shinji Ikari from Neon Genesis Evangelion. You disappoint me. I assume that we will never meet again. A child who has been denied a parent's love because his dad, Gendo Ikari, has more important duties. You know, like saving the world. I have no time to waste on a petulant child. The only time Shinji's dad acknowledges his son is when he needs him to pilot the Eva. I cannot pilot this thing! Stop wasting time. Either get in the Eva or get out. Yeah, those are daddy issues. What? Uh, uh, well, father, uh, well... What is it? Hurry up. Uh, well... Don't bother me with such nonsense anymore. <sighs> Listen, dad, I've got kind of a big ask. <coughs> yeah, of course. Anything in my power is yours for the asking, you just name it. Charlie's dad seems to be excited to be in Charlie's life and is willing to look past the different viewpoints to achieve that. As far as dads go, he's a pretty decent guy. It appeared to me that the pilot was setting Lucifer up to be more of a tyrannical father like Shinji's dad, who only sees his daughter as a failure and has no faith in her project. He has lost all his hope for hell and he's simply waiting for her to realize that too. But his absence from his duties as ruler and his failure to protect the denizens of hell could have been the perfect reason for Charlie to be mad at him too, creating the divide between them further. That's what I would class as daddy issues. As it is now, it's completely pointless to point out those daddy issues, especially when they're resolved in the same episode. Hmm, what's another big one? Oh yeah, Alistair. This wacky willy wonka looking fellow is so inconsistent that his inconsistency is the only consistent thing about him. I'm sure some of you are already commenting that that's the point of Alistair and he's meant to be mysterious and unpredictable. You'd argue that we're not supposed to know his true goals yet and everything will make sense in the end. I'd believe that if not for Sin 1. The show has a proven lack of subtlety. Almost everything about the other characters is served to us on a silver platter. So you'd think they would have the restraint if they had anything figured out for Alistair? No way. It's pretty obvious the writers haven't decided what they're gonna do with him yet. So they're just ping-ponging him around from being a good guy. You deliberately brought danger to this place just to have me clean up your mess. I can't have that here. To a chaotic neutral. Why are you even here? For the entertainment. To evil mastermind. Guess who will be pulling all the strings? <laughs> Until they finally make a decision. In the pilot, his reasoning was pretty simple, but also consistent with his role as a shady deal maker. He arrives at the hotel and offers his help to Charlie, with the main reason being that he's simply bored and enjoys watching sinners strive for something better only to fail miserably. And hey, if someone is at the end of the ropes, they're more susceptible to manipulation and deals, so there's motivation for Alistair to stick around. It's a twisted symbiotic relationship where Charlie and Alistair both want sinners to come check in, but have morally opposite reasons, setting the stage for more conflict and drama. Episode 1 tried to establish that with the scene between Alistair and Vaggie, even showing how ready he is to make a deal with someone desperate enough. 
Problem is that the deal had no meaningful strings attached, making the theatrics completely pointless. They do the same thing in the finale with Charlie and Alistair, but once again, it's not a deal for us all. Charlie promises Alistair a favor, but I'd wager the writers don't exactly know what the favor actually is. Alistair is definitely a fan favorite in the series, so the creators may just be using him as jangling keys to keep the audience entertained and thinking of what's going to happen next, which again, not great for consistency. But yeah, those are some of the big ones, but there are a ton of inconsistencies that I could have chosen. Like, how about an arms dealer who doesn't want blood on her hands and doesn't want war? I always thought that I would keep blood off my face. I might lose the ones that I was killing for. Ooh, the new parts of my machine are here. Sign, please. You may want to consider a different career there, Carmine. Or how about Vaggie hiding the fact that she's an exorcist from Charlie? Really? You don't trust Charlie to accept you? Really? Charlie? I wonder what your bitch would think if she found out you are actually one of us, hmm? How can I turn someone away? I can't. It goes against everything I'm trying to do. Everything I believe in. The wings are new. They look nice. Come on, let's go home. Yeah, you're just forcing drama at this point. The third piece of the unholy trinity of writing is convolution, which typically means the writing is unnecessarily complex, confusing, and difficult for audiences to follow and understand. There's a reason why kiss, or keep it simple stupid, is such a light phrase. It's a philosophy that encourages creators to hone in on the central idea or theme of the story. Some of the best narrative works follow this philosophy. Do you know what the pitch behind the movie Alien was? It was only three words long. Jaws in space. That's it. Everything else works to support that premise which allows them to create more depth without losing track of their core theme. Hasbin Hotel is the opposite of that, as there's no core theme. It seems that Vivzy Pop's goal is to dazzle audience with wacky characters, needlessly extensive lore, and mystery boxes that would keep film theory busy for years. In just 30 minutes, the pilot alone has more content than whole seasons of other shows. The best way I could describe the convoluted writing of Hasbin Hotel is as though the writers wrote down cool ideas, put them all in the hat, put that hat in a blender, and then try to make a story out of the bits of paper connected by the thread from that hat. The show didn't have to be as complicated as it is now. You could have just focused on redemption, with each episode tackling an individual sin, exploring the reasons behind it, and how to overcome it. But no, we had to introduce turf wars, grand conspiracies, battles between angels and demons, murder mysteries, and so on and so forth. Look, I'm glad that Vivzy Pop got a chance to make her show. I'm sure she spent years developing all kinds of ideas for it, and I can understand her excitement about showcasing them. But the greatest creators are those who can curate those ideas and adapt them in a way that fits the central theme of the story. The hardest single thing to do as a filmmaker is to choose your subject. What are you going to do? A bit like being a painter, what are you going to paint? And when you first begin, there's a million options and because in one tends to go in circles. As you get more experienced or get more, yeah, older, uh, your choices become more focused. As the show is right now, I don't think the writers could even tell me what the theme is. They'd probably resort to just giving me the synopsis again. And you can really sense the aimlessness, not only in the plot, but in the narrative too. Let's break down episode 2 for example. We start with Charlie freaking out about the angels cutting the deadline of the extermination by half, which motivates her to go out and look for more guests for the hotel. Then Serpentius attacks the hotel and challenges Alistair. Oh, there you are. So we need to introduce Serpentius. While he introduces himself, he mentions the V's. Wait, who are the V's? Oh, nobody important. So we cut to the V's, because obviously we need to introduce them now. We get to see Vox Tech and what it does, and then we're introduced to Vox. Vox gets a call from Velvet, so we need to introduce her. She also sets up a new conflict and introduces Valentino. But we're not done yet, as we now follow Vox on his route to Velvet, during which he introduces Vox Tech Angelic Security and also mentions Carmilla. Try to get that bitch Carmilla on the books. At this point, I was expecting us to cut to Carmilla and find out what her deal is. Luckily, we don't. But we still go to Velvet's boutique and watch her pick dresses. Riveting. After that, we go to introduce Valentino, his relationship with Angel Dust, his relationship with Vox, and Vox's relationship with Alistair. Oh hey, we cut back to the hotel. Oh wait, no, never mind, we cut back to the V's. At this point, do you even remember what the original goal of the episode was? Oh, and, and did I mention that this episode is about apologizing and forgiveness? 
Yeah, that comes halfway through the episode. Long story short, the creators took away screen time from Charlie to introduce a bunch of side characters and side plots that aren't even that interesting or relevant to the main conflict set up by the start of the episode. And sure, many animated shows have an A plot and a B plot, but in this case there's like five different plots going at the same time. That's what I mean about Idea Hat in the blender. Honestly, it wouldn't be so bad if they paced out the episode and actually focused more on Charlie and Serpentius. Let the fight play out as it did and Serpentius gets sent flying across town. Charlie feels bad for him and goes to make sure he's okay. We can then zoom in on the drone and see the Vox watching the whole fight play out. We have the song and rework the lyrics a bit to introduce the Vs and let them scheme. Cut back to Charlie finding Serpentius. She helps him up and the two have a genuine conversation. From what I gathered, Serpentius is a fairly decent guy who seems to be a villain only to earn respect and not be looked down on. Something I'm sure Charlie could relate to. If they don't kill you, go ahead and do it yourself, you miserable failure! I... I... I think Dad was right about me. Allowing them to already establish a bond. She offers him an alternative to villainy and takes him back to the hotel. Then the episode could play out pretty much as it does, though I would probably have pensions do something other than set up spy cameras, considering the show established that they don't work on Alistair. This face was made for radio. It should be something that would hurt Charlie more, which would give Pinches more agency in his decision. I mean, it would be nice to have an ethical dilemma in a show about redemption, you know? Unfortunately, the creators are too busy spinning too many plates all at once. With the amount of things going on, we rarely spend time redeeming souls. In half a year, we only managed to redeem one soul. If overpopulation was actually a real thing in hell, I don't think Charlie's Hasman Hotel would have solved the problem. In short, any way you're calculating this, there is no way that Charlie's Hotel accomplishes its true mission in under 14 million souls. Fourteen million souls. I think the subplots could have worked if they had any relevance to the main plot. So for example, if episode 3 was about trust, you could have had the Hasbin Hotel crew learning about trust while showcasing how the lack of trust is affecting the overlords during the meeting. But no, the meeting was just there to introduce some new characters and some side plots. Besides the exposition, they don't even discuss anything in that meeting. Carmilla and Velvet just have an argument, and the meeting kind of just ends. Even the side character was like... <laughs> What the hell? We literally just got here. Great. At least you're aware of how pointless this scene was. Honestly, all they need to do is sit down and pinpoint exactly what the theme of the show is. Is it about chasing one's dream? Redemption? Justice? Morality? Late stage capitalism? Fantasy warfare? Corruption? The nature of free will? Rebellion? Because the show plays with all these themes, but never really focuses on one, which is what makes the story so convoluted. Sorry if I sound harsh, but ignorance simply means a lack of research or understanding of the subject a writer is tackling. Do you know the common phrase, write what you know? It's a good rule to have that grounds the writer and allows them to take inspiration from their personal experiences and the knowledge that they already have. However, there's also another phrase that should accompany the first one, which is, do your research. If you're going to tackle things such as the biblical heaven and hell, and the topics of redemption, you have to have a fundamental understanding of those topics. This means doing more research than just watching a YouTube video on Paradise Lost. It is sexy Satan called out God in front of all of his friends. There was a big old war in heaven and Satan and his friends unsurprisingly lost. Getting the research done early will actually improve your writing, your character design, and your world building. Hasbin Hotel lacks those fundamentals and it does affect the quality of the story. Sure, you'll see pentagrams, devil horns, angel wings, and characters with the same name as their biblical counterparts, but besides the surface level similarities, Viv Z Pop's interpretation of the afterlife is sterile. Think of all the imaginative depictions of hell that we had throughout history, and the most Hasbin Hotel could do is a slightly more rundown Los Angeles. The best way to describe this hell is GTA 5 multiplayer with a demonic texture pack. Everyone's a jerk, and you might get killed randomly. Speaking of death, this criticism has been brought up many times by other people. But what happens when a sinner is killed? Do they go to super hell or do they just cease to exist? If it's the latter, then it's pretty antithetical to the point of hell. After all, hell is meant to be an eternal place of agony that no one can escape, not even through death. The fact that sinners laugh at Charlie's idea pretty much confirms that hell is not a place of endless torment and suffering. It just seems to be a normal world with a hellish coat of paint and looser laws. Sinners here have jobs, own property, go to nightclubs, make relationships, friends and enemies, start businesses and live pretty decent afterlives. Instead of a government, hell is being run by powerful overlords who run different businesses or industries. It's basically an anarcho-capitalist wet dream. I guess one could describe that as hell. <laughs> 
And heaven isn't all that different either. Sure, you have no death or carnage, but it still looks like a Californian city, with its coffee shops, billboards, and multi-story buildings. Imagine being a good, decent person all your life, only to end up working as a barista and live in an apartment in the afterlife. Ah! In the show, heaven and hell don't really have a symbolic meaning. They're basically just different nations, with not too much differentiating them. While this may not necessarily be a bad thing, as many creators will have different interpretations of established lore, it does showcase a lack of fundamental understanding of the heaven and hell mythos. None of the characters know what gets anyone into heaven, and it may just be because the creators themselves don't know. Maybe Hasbin Hotel could have taken a page from the TV series Lucifer. I take no part in who goes to hell. Then who does? You humans. <laughs> You send yourselves, driven down by your own guilt. The best part? The doors aren't locked. You could leave any time. Ironically enough, they almost had this with Sir Pentius. Who, me? Even as the comedic relief, I'd argue that he's the most well-written character in the show, and actually has an arc. It's pretty clear that he's not a bad guy, but he feels like he has to be in order to gain respect from others. It's a sign of low self-esteem, which is made even more clear through his interaction with Cherry Bomb. Miss Bomb, I I'd like to buy you a drink. Why? Didn't you say we're arch rivals? Uh, um, uh, because I'm buying everyone a drink. He's shy, awkward, and timid around her because he believes he's not good enough for her. But by building a friendship with the Hasbin Hotel team and earning their respect, he builds up his confidence and the courage to show his true feelings. Uh, Miss Cherry Bomb, I love you. Remember me! That was kinda hot. And perform a heroic and selfless act. It's a shame the show didn't utilize on this and simply played his death for laughs. The reason for that is probably sin number five. <laughs> Ugh, subversion. Ever since the Star Wars sequels, this has become a loaded word that tends to start long-winded media debates. Objection! Lame and unoriginal! Sustained. On its own, subverting the audience's expectation is not necessarily a sin, as it can be used for comedy and some unique storytelling. It's a tool used to challenge established norms and offer fresh perspectives on the subject. Shrek is a great example of that, as it uses subversion for comedy and manages to teach our viewers that it's our actions that define us, and not who we are or what we are. And subverting the fairy tale tropes allows the creators to do that. You're not exactly what I expected. South Park is also great at subverting expectations, by often depicting kids as smarter than the adults of the town. This, this is making insanely good sense to me. Using this to provide fun and insightful social commentary. But nowadays, many writers tend to be subversive for subversion's sake, using their art to critique the old, established norms without offering new or better perspectives. You're just getting the worst of both worlds. Not only are you not offering anything insightful, you're also harming your own story and characters. Some tropes are there for a very good reason, so it would be wise if you understand why they're there to begin with before you start subverting them. Going back to Hasbin Hotel, what kind of expectations is the show subverting? Sup? I don't know, how about that some angels are just as sinful, murderous, and corrupt as the demons? Yeah, that's a pretty big one. Rip that, he's Ooh. not about that or ass! You just, just chill, dude. Ooh. But why, you may ask? Wouldn't this be an interesting and fresh take on the dichotomy of angels and demons, allowing us to see the goodness of demons and the flaws of the angels? It would be great if not for the fact that the premise of the show is to rehabilitate demons to be virtuous enough to get into heaven. You know, where angels are? If heaven is full of violent jerks, then what virtues are the demons meant to aspire to? It doesn't work. You could have still had angels as the bad guys by presenting them as arrogant and stubborn, unwilling to entertain the idea that sinners could ever reach the same level of holiness. You didn't have to make them complete psychopaths. Speaking of psychopaths, Hasbin Hotel has a very subversive way of portraying characters where I can't really tell whether they're good guys or bad guys. Ambiguity can be good, but it's not what I have in mind. Typically, you'd have the villain display negative traits such as rudeness, violent tendencies, impatience, general lack of care. You know, something that makes us dislike them, and something that works well with their position as a villain. But in Hasbin Hotel, all is unclear. Everyone swears at each other, flips each other off, even acts violently towards one another. Ironically, the overlords, the ones who apparently are the most sadistic and dangerous, are also the ones that are most polite, patient, caring, and displaying more kindness than even some of the angels and lesser sinners. 
the show hints that these guys are the most dangerous beings in hell, but then you watch them comfort each other, show politeness, civility, and you start to question whether they're actually as evil as the show is trying to make them appear, and I could see that working. These overlords could be the most powerful, but with an absent Lucifer, they're also in charge of keeping order in hell and developing some of those positive traits as a professional requirement. But that's just my speculation. It could also be that the creators just care about the overlords more, and they don't want them to appear as immature brats. You know, like the rest of the characters. Oh, and speaking of Lucifer, have you been subverted by the fact that the King of Hell is actually a nice guy with depression who makes rubber duckies? I sure have, especially since that undermines Charlie's daddy issues and Lucifer's own depression. Now, I know that depression comes in many different forms and sometimes the most cheerful people can be the most depressed, but would anyone even think that Lucifer had depression if he didn't flat out say it? Take that depression! I don't think so. When I think of a depressed ruler of hell, I think of Dark Souls. None will have meaning and you won't even care. Imagine how cool it would have been if we saw Charlie looking at her father withering away in the darkness, a warning of what happens when one loses hope and gives up. But hey, if you want that cheerful angle, maybe you could have seen him in front of a mirror forcing himself to be a beat and cheerful for the sake of his daughter. That would have recontextualized his antics and make them a bit more meaningful. It would have made him breaking down much more impactful too. But no, he's just quirky from the start, which makes his second song almost out of character for him. Hasbin Hotel seems to have also taken a page from Marvel films and other adult animations when it comes to subversive humor. The most egregious subversion is when a serious or tragic moment is played for a laugh. It's such a gamble when you use it. On one hand, you have a joke and you need those for comedy. On the other hand, you could have engaged your audience on a much more meaningful level by showing the respect for that tragic moment. And boy, if that joke doesn't land, you lost the chance to have either. So you remember Sir Pencha's sacrifice in the season finale. The guy was ready to save the day with a heroic attack, only to be poofed out of existence before he could do anything. Oh, what? <laughs> ah, that could have been ugly. <laughs> sure, I can see how that's funny. But do you really want that kind of a cheap gag to send off one of the most likable characters in the show? The real subversion would have been actually giving the comic relief character a win or at least do some kind of impact. Because now, he started off as a completely useless and harmless villain and he finished by being a completely useless and harmless hero. It's a shame, but at least he's not out of the picture yet. All in all, subversion can be a useful tool to explore different points of view and question the status quo in a fun and creative way, but it requires a level of maturity for it to be successful. Oh hey, we're in sin number 6. Immaturity Hasbin Hotel joins its contemporaries by being another show that it uses excessive swearing, violence, sexual themes and offensive visuals as part of its comedy. On one hand, when you're dealing with hell and sinners, it seems appropriate. On the other hand, it's getting really really stale by now. And it might not even be Hasbin Hotel's fault. If this show had come out 15 years ago, it might have been seen as a rebellious show that is pushing boundaries of adult animation. But now, when almost all of the adult shows are doing it, it does give the impression that the whole animation industry is just filled with overgrown teenagers who think swearing and sex jokes are funny. Wiener. Those jokes can be funny, yes, but I'm a bit worried that that's the only type of humor we're going to get from adult shows. I'm not going to say anything new here, but I find it strange that there are still writers who believe that their work needs to have violence, sex and swearing to be seen as grown up or mature. Ironically, in most cases, the results are actually the opposite. Kaguya is at the stage where kids laugh at words like wiener and boobs. It's a phase everyone goes through. And while it's difficult to determine how much graphic content is the right amount, it's pretty clear that too much of it makes the story appear more immature than not using it at all. This is classy art! To say the characters of Hasbin Hotel swear a lot would be an understatement, but it's clear it's something the show is proud of. Viv Pop has addressed the swearing issue, but simply told the critics that it's a type of comedy that she likes and if they don't like it, they don't have to watch it. Not the best mindset to have, but okay. She notes that she grew up with Seth Rogen comedies and South Park and used that as her inspiration. The swearing is so important to her that Amazon even ran a marketing campaign where the cast had to say as many swear words as they could within the time frame. I think I only know three swear words. All the love him. All the love him. He gets he gets he gets Ooh, very edgy. A quick note about South Park. The reason why the main characters swear a lot in the show is because they're immature kids. Trey Parker and Matt Stone wanted to capture how kids would typically speak when their parents aren't around. So it was meant to create a sense of authenticity. I'll bet if you've eavesdropped on a bunch of fourth graders today, the language would be 
pretty close to what you hear on South Park. I think we talked like this when I, when I was in fourth and fifth grade. And it was like, let's, have, <clears> let's <throat> do a show where kids talk the way kids talk. Randy swears the most because he's typically portrayed as a man-child, so it makes sense for him to swear a lot. Meanwhile, I don't see the narrative purpose behind the swearing in Hasbin Hotel. It doesn't really differentiate one character from another. It seems that the only reason for the swearing is because the creator thinks it's cool, which is indicative of an immature writer. But honestly, the swearing fits the overall childish and nihilistic tone that the show presents. Almost every character talks and acts like they came straight out of high school. It's not an act! It's not a face! Their designs are so busy and necessarily complicated that they would give Cole Steel the Hedgehog a run for his money. The Exorcists look like they belong on a My Chemical Romance cover. And Hell itself looks a lot like what I expect the Amazing Atheist to describe Hell as. Not a place of torture and damnation, but a cool place where free thinkers and rebels party, drink and have sex. Come to think of it, the show does fill me with a sense of nostalgia for that early 2000s emo kid phase that many of us probably went through. I could imagine an edgy teen's notebook filled with sketches that would probably fit into the Hasbin Hotel universe. With that in mind, I think I'm starting to understand why the writing keeps shifting away from the hotel itself. The creators aren't mature enough yet to tackle serious subjects such as depression, addiction, abuse, acceptance or redemption. They can do the sinning and rebelling part well, but what can they offer for those wanting to improve themselves or escape a toxic lifestyle? Some corporate team building exercises? This is stupid. Hasbin Hotel is not exactly interested in delving into the world of psychology, self-improvement or philosophy beyond the surface level. They skirt the issues the characters have and don't directly deal with them in any kind of mature or relatable way. They are tough issues, sure, but if you're not going to tackle them, why even have them? Just do your fun songs, cool action scenes, mystery and dark backstories. I know I like to bash on Bojack Horseman, but at least that show wasn't afraid of tackling some pretty intense subjects maturely. It gets easier. Huh? Every day it gets a little easier. Yeah? But you gotta do it every day. That's the hard part. But it does get easier. I may dislike the characters and the expository writing, but some scenes actually made me stop and think about the subject they were exploring. That's too much man and the view from halfway down will always stick with me and they aren't even the best episodes. No! I really should have thought about the view from halfway down! Find your peace, big guy. Find it. Boja Horseman had moments to explore the existential dread and the core of someone's flaws in a very honest way without sacrificing the comedy. I feel like Hasbin Hotel would have benefited from a few of those scenes. But again, it would require the creators to have a serious introspection, which can be intimidating. But it's such a bummer, man! Instead, let's have those issues resolve themselves within a few episodes, so we can get to the quirky and fun parts. Luckily, Vivzy Pop will still have a long career ahead of her, and I'm sure she will hone in on her writing and storytelling skills. That is, if she doesn't commit the final sin. Pride is a sin commonly found in younger writers who often overestimate their own writing capabilities. I'm sure most writers are proud of their work to some extent, but it becomes a problem when they're so proud of their writing they completely ignore the criticism towards them and refuse to improve their craft. Because creators put so much of themselves into their work, criticism can often appear as a personal attack or hate towards them. Is that like a personal attack or something? And thus the criticism gets ignored and the same mistakes are done again and again. You don't have to mollycoddle me. I want to improve my writing. Tell me your real thoughts. All right, well, um, I'm not a huge fan personally of the whole three weeks earlier teaser thing. Just Get out. Um, what? This happens all the time in Hollywood, where creators perceive criticism as sexism, bigotry, or just some online trolling. This isn't a new thing, but it's amusing to see the Hollywood industry taking a page from the author of My Mortal. If you do not like my story, then f off. Stop flaming or I'll report you. Ebony isn't a Mary Sue, okay? She isn't perfect. She's a Satanist. The problem with this mindset is that you're missing the opportunity to improve your skills and utilize the free feedback you receive. After all, if you already think that your writing is perfect, why would you need to improve? Of course, I can understand ignoring some criticism, especially when you're an online creator. Not everyone makes articulate points, and they can be rather... passionate, which often results in unproductive critique. Wow! That was shit! <laughs> <laughs> But considering the Hasbin Hotel pilot came out over four years ago, I feel like Vivzy Pop had plenty of time to receive some constructive feedback and could have made improvements for the Amazon series. Sadly, I don't think that was done. The same issues that were brought up in the pilot as well as Hell of a Boss are still present in Hasbin Hotel. In some cases, I think the writing in the pilot is slightly better than the show. I came here because I love seeing wasteful souls struggle to accomplish something meaningful and fail spectacularly. Why do you want to help me if you don't believe in my cause? 
considered an investment in ongoing entertainment for myself. I want to watch the scum of the world struggle to climb up the hill of betterment, only to repeatedly trip and tumble down to the fiery pit of failure. Which is surprising considering the show had nine other writers to help out. The counter argument to this would be that Vivzy Pop has a huge dedicated fan base who likes her work the way it is now. So why change it, right? Maybe. But just because a lot of people like something doesn't make it good. It makes it profitable. I can see the appeal of Vivzy Pop's works. Her animations are far above a lot of her contemporaries. And her character designs do speak to a lot of nonconformist minds out there. The show clearly had a lot of time put into it in order to be fun, visually appealing and entertaining. But I can't help but wonder how amazing it would have been if the same care was put into the writing as well. While I praise Vivzy Pop's talent and determination, I feel that maybe she's a little bit too determined. She clearly has a vision and sticks to it without making too many compromises. You can tell that in her art style and animation. She had so many little details and complexities to her character designs, I can imagine the nightmare of animating them. Yet, she does it anyway, logistics be damned. I feel like the same kind of overambitious mindset is reflecting in her convoluted writing too, as she tries to stuff as much lore into the series as she can, regardless whether that's gonna affect the consistency, pacing or coherency. This overambition is reflected in Charlie's character too. A girl built a hotel even before finding out whether she can redeem a sinner. Her entire premise is based on, trust me bro, it will work. She never gives evidence or a plan how to redeem a sinner. All she has is a pitch and a dream of it working. Whenever anyone brings some valid concerns, she just goes, Ooh, these are my people, I have to try. I, I don't know how much you can realistically expect from them in heaven. These are our people, Dad. I I have to try. Our shared problem of overpopulation in hell. Oh, well, <laughs> that's not a problem. We got that covered. Those are my people. Charlie, do you know that the road to hell is paved with good intentions? Despite how much she wants it, she never seems to be prepared to address the issues or give a reasonable plan of action. We've done trust falls. We've tried sharing our feelings. We only have a couple months left before the angels come home. For the most part, it appears that she's pretty much winging it and hoping for the best. Almost like Vivzy Pop herself. In fact, the show makes a lot more sense if you interpret it as an animator trying to get her show greenlit. She has to go to pitch meetings with people in power who tend to dismiss and reject her ideas. Let me stop you right there, oh. save us all precious time. Okay. She has to endure the mockery of her peers. Oh, looks like your little hotel didn't work out so well. <laughs> and the disappointment of her parents. Oh, this place sure looks, uh, uh huh. But through sheer determination and help from her supportive friends, she achieves her goal. It's interesting to see that show through that perspective, and it can explain a lot of the writing and directing decisions. I am very much a mix between Baggy and Charlie, though, because like Charlie, yeah. like all the like obstacles she faced, like you know, people being shitty and people like saying you'll never accomplish this or whatever. Like that's kind of a common experience for any kind of creator. And mm. I'm, I feel like the stubbornness she has mm. is something that I've had to have, like just keeping going. Like mm -hmm. whether or not that was Vivzy Pop's intention, I don't know. But as I watched the show, I felt that Vivzy Pop almost needed to take a step back and think beyond herself and the things she likes. Maybe some characters aren't as necessary as others. Maybe you don't need so many subplots. Maybe some of the designs could be simplified to better represent the character's personality and sin. Maybe you shouldn't dress everyone in steampunk and Victorian attire. Is it 1750? Burn it like the witches who wore it! Maybe some of the characters shouldn't be furries. Critters will ask these questions only when they're ready to accept that their work is flawed and needs to be changed. Cut! Okay, Angel, I need you to be less horny if possible. Sadly, I don't think this video will be watched by Vivzy. And if it will, it won't matter because they already started voicing lines for season two, which means the script was already written and they won't be able to make any drastic or radical changes to improve it. Season two will most likely have the very same issues that I pointed out in this video. However, I didn't make this video for Vivzy Pop or to critique her. The same sins can be found in all modern writing, which is a thing I would like to change. So I hope that some aspiring writers will take my advice into consideration as they write their own stories. Thank you all for watching. I think this is the last time I'm making such a long video. Looks like the 70% of you were right, but I hope this was fun and informative for you. While I tried to censor some of the swearing, I don't think this will be fully monetizable. So if you want to support my work, consider leaving a super thanks or leave a tip on buy me a coffee. Or if you just want to hang out, make sure you join the Discord channel. All the links will be in the description.